Uh, hello, uh, thank you for coming here today. Uh, thank you to the family for uh, welcoming me for a second time. Uh, I'm so happy that there aren't any empty seats here because when I saw the weather this morning, I thought, oh my God, nobody's going to want to get out of bed. Uh, but uh, uh, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to come over here. It's uh, great to see that you guys are interested in learning how to optimize your sales process. Um, just for me to understand uh, uh, how much uh, detail I should go into or how basic or how uh, complex uh, I should talk, I would love to see how many of you have already started a business. So could you raise your hand if you're already? Okay, and the rest of you are contemplating or preparing to start a business, correct? Okay, all right. Uh, all right, so what I'm gonna do then, because there's a few in the audience who aren't quite at that stage yet, who either haven't found it yet or are about to found, what I'm gonna do is do a pretty general uh, introduction. I'm gonna start off quite simple and then go a bit more into detail as the presentation progresses. So uh, if you have any questions in the middle or you want to point something out or you didn't hear something or understand something, please just uh, raise your hand or just say, Clarissa, I didn't get that, and I'm happy uh, uh, to respond. So absolutely no worries. You can totally interact with me. I'm even happy if you have questions during. Otherwise, we can go through all of the issues you don't understand or you would like to know more about at the end. Okay, so uh, tips and tricks to optimize your sales process. The first talk I gave here was on a very specific uh, theme. It was on smarter lead management. So it was really about you know, the qualification phase, about how to register your leads. And I will talk a little bit about that later because let's face it, it's super important no matter if you're already selling, no matter if you already have customers or not. Um, but what I want to do today is uh, talk about a more uh, general theme and kind of zoom out into the big picture. But rather than talking about uh, you know, the perfect methodology or the perfect structure or the one and only way to do it, I would like to talk about some questions you need to ask yourself and a way of thinking about your business that will help you apply uh, the things you learned here today to your own business. Because I'm sure that all of you have uh, different focus points. I'm sure that your products and your services all differ from each other. I hope they differ from each other. Um, so it wouldn't really make sense to focus it on one industry or one type of product or one type of business. So uh, to uh, give you an idea of uh, why I'm even talking about this and how I know about all this stuff, um, I work for a company called uh, Team Leader, and uh, basically what Team Leader does is it helps small and medium-sized businesses to stay organized, to collaborate with their team, and to manage their business. It's an all-in-one CRM, project management and invoicing tool, and uh, it's focused on businesses that are in that growth phase. So uh, we really focus a lot on uh, using uh, technology and using a data-driven approach to structuring our sales and to managing our sales, um, which is why our uh, CRM uh, module is very, very important. It's one of the main aspects of our tool. And CRM, uh, for those of you who maybe have not heard this term before, stands for Customer Relations Management. And that is important, obviously, for your sales cycle because it kind of lays the foundation for it. So, because of the tool that we developed, um, we've applied what we've learned along the way to structuring our own business, and I'd like to share some of those insights with you today. So, let's start with the basics. Why do you need to set up a process? What, what, what's the reason for it? Why, why, why is it important to do it? What is a sales process even? Uh, what does that consist of? What does that mean? And how do you set that up? How does a sales process work? These are the questions that we should probably start with to have a nice foundation upon which we can later uh, 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 go in into more detail. So, the reason you should have a sales process is because it's basically, you can, you can think of it as a backbone for your organization. It's, it's, a, it's a structure that helps you build things on top of it. And having a sales process will allow you later to focus in on the things that didn't work, to set up a marketing process, to optimize your deal flow, your internal workflow, all of those things. Not having a sales process means that you're just going out, you're uh, without a structured approach, 
and you're kind of seeing what happens, right? I mean, I guess I don't have to tell you this, having a plan always makes more sense than having no plan, but think of it as the backbone upon which the rest of your business is built, because that's the point of your business. You would like to sell a service or a product. The next point is that having a sales process enables you to do accurate forecasting. Now, what do I mean with this? Having accurate forecasting means you're able to plan the future. If you're able to plan the future, you're able to allocate resources. You know what are the next steps for your business. Where can you tweak things? Where can you optimize things? Where are the problems? What can you expect for your future quarter? If you have a sales process in place, you are able to not only uh, um, organize the next steps in a way that helps you grow, but you're also able to understand what you are to expect without really knowing what the future brings. The next point is that it allows sales and marketing to work together efficiently. Uh, I, don't, I think I don't need to tell you that sales and marketing uh, should cooperate very closely with each other. And the way they do that and how they do that is really based on the structure you have in place. Otherwise, it's a whole bunch of meetings and a whole bunch of talking, but it's very difficult to execute on steps that you agree on or on uh, insights that you get or on decisions that you make. Because if you don't have a process in place, you are maybe doing something, but everything that happens after that is more or less chaotic and a little bit random. And so that's obviously something you would like to avoid. And the last point, obviously, is that it facilitates fast root cause analysis. And what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is, when you have a structure in place and you know, okay, these are the steps that my sales reps are going to take, you can say, all right, I have a problem, I'm not happy with the results of this quarter, or I see that something is taking too long, or something is not going the way I want it to go, or my business is slowing down, or the growth isn't uh, um, going as I, as I had planned. How do you find the problem for that if you don't understand where and how your business works? When you have a structure and you know, okay, these are the steps that I have, and this is the process that I have in place, it's very easy to identify where the problem lies. And once you've identified where the problem lies, you're able to solve it. Um, a great example is, uh, uh, you know, let's say uh, you're running um, a business that um, has some kind of a service and you've projected a growth of, I don't know, 20% in the next quarter and you see, okay, you're not quite there, you're not quite there yet. You only have 5% or 10% growth and you're not quite sure why that is because you've done your forecasting, right? You've understood, okay, this is what to expect in the next quarter. You, what you then do is you go about and you, you look at your organization and you think, all right, where does it lie? Does it lie in the very beginning before the leads come in? Does it maybe lie in the online marketing part or in the lead generation part? Or maybe the problem is, hmm, the, 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 the contact point between your sales reps and the customers that you would like to bring in. Maybe that's where the bottleneck lies. These bottlenecks are something that you can only identify once you know what happens after each step. And knowing that is going to help you a lot and going to take you a long way as you progress with your business and as you grow. That's just for extra show. So, the first step basically is understanding your business. Before you go about setting up a structure, you need to know how your business works. That means more than just understanding what your market is, who your competitors are, how your product works, or how you would like to uh, develop it in the future. What that means is, you need to understand where and how do I get my leads from. What does that mean exactly? It means the touch points of all of your potential customers, your partners, your investors, your anybody who basically comes in, into contact with your business and engages with your company, those are the touch points that you need to identify. So in our case, we have a SaaS business, right? So a lot of our leads come in through online marketing. They come in through Google Ads, through the website, through referrals and things like that. What we've done is we've created a list. We know exactly all of our leads fall into one of these categories. They come from a certain place. And in all of those touch points, there is a different process after they come into contact with you. Because somebody who 
comes into contact with your business through the website has most probably already understood what you do or at least has engaged enough with your company to understand what you are trying to offer. Whereas somebody who maybe comes in through a referral or an introduction, maybe they haven't really engaged with your website yet or with your product. So they're not exactly sure how it is that you can help their business. So the process that comes after they come in contact with you will be a completely different process. It's like uh, this typical thing you, you see at te te tech conferences and pitching events. You know, the sentence that you hear is that you should always adapt your pitch. That's very true, and the reason you should do that, obviously, is because there are different interests involved and different goals and intentions when different leads and different kinds of customers and partners come into contact with you. So it's very important to kind of take a step back and kind of think about, all right, where are they coming from? What are the points that they contact me? And how do I want to approach them when they do? The next part is understanding who they are. So you've probably heard this before, uh, this term of uh, buying personas. That's extremely important because that kind of sums up the intention, the need, and the potential of each lead that comes into contact with you. So, Somebody who is, I don't know, a super tech savvy and understands a lot about the markets, understands all of the competitors and the players involved, and comes into contact with you with, with questions will probably have extremely detailed and complex questions, as opposed to somebody who just types into Google, hmm, problem, solution, France. So, Understanding who your buyer personas are, are really, really, really important in order to understand how you should deal with them, how you should interact with them, what you should emphasize in your communication, um, or even understanding what they might need in the process before you try to close them, before you try to sign a contract and get them to buy your product or your service. So the way I like to do this is that I really like to make it very uh, uh, visual, I like to make it very personal. Let's say I have five buyer personas, each buyer persona ha gets a nickname, they get a certain picture, something that helps me to remember it, something that helps me to understand, okay, this is Mr. I don't know, know it all, and this is Mrs. Ask a lot of questions, or this is the need that this kind of buyer persona has, and therefore the questions that this kind of buyer persona has will go along this direction. So knowing where they come from, how they engage with you, and who they are, what their needs are, will really help you along the way. The next point, obviously, is uh, understanding how to register them. So registering your leads is important for the main reason that you should learn from all of your experiences and all of the data that you get along the way. And the way you learn is by looking at the information you've collected. So having a system in place that registers who they are, where they're from, what their problem is, what their pain points are, um, what tool they or what product or service they may already use, or where they want to go with their business. Understanding that and saving that somewhere, collecting that data and categorizing that data, that's something you should know before you go and set up a sales process. So that's something you should have in place as an organizational point. You should think about whether you want to put it in Excel, whether you want to put it on Post-its, which I don't recommend, or whether you want to use a tool that will help you to do that. And the choosing of this tool, by the way, is also part of the process. You should understand what you will need as your business grows and how your tool is supposed to help you optimize that and help your life, uh, help your business and make your life easier while you use it. And the next point obviously is uh, uh, probably one of the most important is what are your goals with your business? And with that, I don't just mean revolutionizing an industry or taking over this market, which uh, is a great goal to have. But by that, I mean, what kind of monthly recurring revenue am I aiming for? What do I need to make throughout the whole year? What's my runway? How many customers do I need to get in to be able to uh, uh, grow as I would like to grow according to the resources that I have? Um, what's the time frame that I'm thinking about here? Um, 
all of these questions should be answered beforehand because if you don't know that, then you will not know how to uh, set up steps that will make that go faster or how to set up steps that will rule out objections or problems. You have to understand where you're going and what the, um, uh, the, the sub, sub points are in order to achieve that goal. So once you've asked yourself these five questions, um, uh, or four questions, the last thing you should basically think about is what kind of skill sets do I need for my team? And with skill sets I mean not just you know, being able to emphasize, being able to communicate as a sales rep, um, being able to understand the needs of others, but what I mean by that is how does the sales rep um, uh, act or what knowledge should the sales rep have in order to be able to really engage well with your lead and rule out possible pain points. So in our case, we have different kinds of sales reps. We do it a little bit more in unconventionally. We don't just have one sales rep that is more or less an account manager. What we have is one person who, as an inside sales rep, talks to the people and to the leads that come in and kind of just does qualification and understands, okay, who are you? What are you looking for? What are the problems that you face? Um, what kind of a solution are you looking for? What kind of a budget do you have? Um, uh, what kind of uh, uh, um, cooperation would you like to envision in the future? All those kinds of things. This, the next step after that is someone who really has the technical know-how and the detailed knowledge to be able to take it a step further. Once we have established that this lead has a problem we can actually solve. Um, the whole topic of qualification is a very, very big one. I could talk about it really for, for hours, but uh, because we're trying to focus on one topic here, I'm just going to keep it quite short. Qualification is extremely important and it should be somehow reflected also in the people that you choose for your team. So for those of you who are uh, not quite at that step yet, who haven't founded your business yet, and you will go out at some point and you will recruit people for your sales team. You should understand what kind of people you need. Maybe you need someone who has a lot of communication skills but also the technical know-how. Or maybe you need somebody who is extremely flexible with dealing with different kinds of leads and different kinds of customers. Or maybe you need somebody who combines all of those things. But understanding what, the, what skill sets you require is a really important step because your sales process depends on that as well and it's also vice versa. If you have three different sales reps doing different things, your process will reflect that, rather than if you have one account manager, one salesperson who takes over the entire process from beginning to end. Is that clear so far? Yeah? All right, great. So, the next step is actually setting it up. Before you set it up, you should understand one thing. What does a sales process even consist of? It consists of a sales funnel, and the goal of a sales funnel is to close your customer. So it's all the steps that happen before the customer buys your product or signs a contract for your service. It's everything you do the qualification, the, the, uh, the demos you might do, or the meetings you might have, or the calls you might have. Everything that you do before you close a customer, that's what your funnel is. That, combined with your customer journey, is your sales process. The difference between a sales funnel and a customer journey is that the goal of your customer journey is usually to upsell or to retain the customer or to keep the customer happy and make sure that they are successful in, the, in uh, um, benefiting from your product or your service. So these two things combined are what your sales process are and it's very important to differentiate between those two things because they each have different goals and different intentions. If you mix those up, you might come into difficulties later understanding where your pain points are and where your bottlenecks are. So this is an example of a very, very basic uh, sales process. Lead comes in, lead is qualified by a sales rep, meaning 
there is, uh, we have established that uh, there is a problem that we can solve. Then it comes into negotiation phase. You talk about, yeah, um, the, your conditions or um, the corner points of your corporation or pricing, all those kinds of things. An offer is made and then hopefully won. If it's won, the meaning you have closed your customer, the next step is making sure the customer is happy, which is the second step I was talking about, your customer journey. That's basically the part that ensures you are retaining your customer and keeping them happy. So this is a very, very general structure. I, I'm, I'm not saying this is the only structure that there is, but it's something that you can think about when you look at your own business to really understand, okay, maybe I don't need the negotiation part because maybe the contact point with your leads is different. Maybe you can sign up immediately online and you have touchless sales. That's possible. But knowing that the, there are different steps that lead to a happy customer and structuring it in a way that's logical, that's causal, and that makes sense for you is crucial. The biggest tip I have for doing this is to consider scalability from the very beginning. So a nice story is, uh, in our case, our uh, CEO, Jeroen, when he started off uh, with team leader, he basically drove around all of Belgium in his car and talked to every single lead face to face. He drove out there, he understood their business, he talked to them, he met the colleagues, he asked them about how they work, what their goals are, and how team leader could maybe help them. And that's how he went about doing all of these steps in one. But obviously, at this point in time, we have thousands of customers, that's not scalable anymore, right? So you can't go out and drive to every single customer and spend half a day there. So you should consider the scalability from the beginning because at some point, your growth will be exponential, hopefully, and you will need to react very, very quickly without having to restructure everything. Why? Because your sales reps need to work with what they know. They need to apply the knowledge that they have gathered up until that point and be able to develop it for, for the future in a way that is scalable. So think about each of those steps and whether you can apply your process in each of those steps for five customers, for 500 customers, and for 5,000 customers. If there is a step in there that you think, okay, this is definitely not doable when I have 5,000 customers, then how can you set it up already from the beginning that you can still facilitate that high amount of growth and that amount of customers later on? Obviously, it's not always possible from the very beginning, but still, it makes sense to put a structure in place that doesn't have to be changed too much. So let's say that you've set up, uh, I don't know, if you have a, um, uh, a tech product, you've set up a way to do a demonstration or to test it out. And this um, uh, requires a lot of time and effort. If you set it up in a way in the beginning that is very complicated and very time consuming and makes it difficult to change later, then maybe the way you set it up should be simplified or shorter. Or it should be um, structured so that it's easy and flexible to be changed later. Second step, obviously, is implementing tools. Now, I could talk about old school sales that, you know, kind of involve a sales rep going out with his suitcase and his products and knocking on people's doors. That would also be uh, uh, talking about sales. But we live in a day and age where tools can really, really help you and really help you to optimize your workflow. So I'm just going to talk about it like it's an obligation. You really should think about which tools that are out there that can help you from the beginning. Um, depending on your business, you will most probably need a CRM. Now, what's the alternative to a CRM tool? Mostly it's Excel. Excel is great, it has a lot of functionalities, it does a great job, but at some point you will lose your overview, it won't be easy to share with your colleagues, you can't really collaborate in it, uh, you have to do everything yourself. Think about which CRM tool works for you, so you can grow your business easily and all of your sales, rep under, uh, sales reps understand where you are at this point in time. There's lots of CRM tools out there. Obviously, I'm a big fan of our own, but think about 
what you need and the touch points you have, the steps you need to take, all of the questions you asked in the beginning, and if this CRM tool can help you. The next thing and is also super important, that's project management. Why is it important? It's important because, sure, you can delegate your tasks via email all the time. That works. You can tell people, all right, I need this and this. Um, please uh, um, execute this task or this project on Slack. You can do all of those things. But to really be organized and to really understand which tasks are still open, who is responsible for it, um, who's, who's accountable for it, what's the deadline, where are you in the phase, you need a tool to help you do that. Invoicing is also important. Why? Because you need a professional aligned approach. There's nothing worse than uh, uh, sending out an invoice with the wrong data on it or whether layouting is wrong. And I say this because thinking about an invoicing tool from the very beginning will make it easier later to send it out on high, uh, in high scale. When you have an invoicing tool in place from the very beginning, you are always on top of things. You can scale it easily, whether you have five customers or 500 customers. It will always be easy to manage and to keep an overview. And depending on whether or not your customers and your leads need a lot of help or support, or maybe they need help setting something up, or maybe they have lots of questions they need to ask you. Having a ticketing tool in place, something that organizes the questions and the communication with your customers is also highly important. If you have all of those things, then you can go about setting up a sales process that is optimized, that is automated, that is efficient, and that helps your sales reps rather than confusing your sales reps. Now, what do I mean with defining a set of rules? Defining a set of rules is basically making the life of your sales reps easier. Oh, oops, let's do that. So, defining a set of rules means coming up with certain scenarios. So, one scenario could be you come into contact with a lead through an introduction from another business. This, this business is really happy with your service and uh, writes an email to you and another company saying, hey, I think you guys should talk. I think uh, this could really help you. I'm very happy with their product. Um, uh, why don't you guys take it from here? That's one scenario where you should know exactly what happens after that. Who comes into contact with this person who's introduced to you? Is it sales rep one or sales rep two? Is it someone who knows a lot about your uh, 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 tool on a technical level? Or is it someone who is very good at doing qualification from the very beginning? Um, another scenario could be uh, somebody who has been using a competitive product and knows a lot about the different features and functionalities um, that are offered in this market, uh, sends you an email through your contact form and asks you exactly one specific question. What happens after that? Do you send them a basic, this is what we do guide from the very beginning? Probably not, right, because this person probably already knows much more than you need to inform them about. Every point of contact, every point of contact in your selling stage is highly important. Everything counts. So if you, as soon as you pick up the phone and speak to someone and start trying to sell them, the amount of time it takes you, what you say, what you emphasize, how you start, how you end it, what you refer to, um, what you put in the foreground, what you put in the background, all of those things are they're important because you don't have only one shot, but you have very little shots, right? Every, every time you speak to a lead, you should try and make the most out of it and really try and optimize your time. The second part is basically defining roles and responsibilities within your team. So once you have a process that goes from lead uh, uh, comes in, qualification, negotiation, offer, uh, customer is one, and then a, a happy customer uh, and customer retention at the end, you should understand who in your team is responsible for what. I don't recommend setting up a sales process where one person does everything and everyone does everything. 
doesn't make sense for a lot of reasons because it's not scalable, it's hard to keep an overview, and it's really difficult for sales reps then to understand how to move forward to the next stage. Knowing, okay, this person is responsible for the lead and qualification part makes it very easy for the sales rep to pass it on once his or her job is done. It's much more efficient than having someone do everything at once. If you do have someone do everything at once, at least set up a structure in the way that it's very clear what the differences are between each of the phases. So it should be extremely clear for your sales reps that uh, the difference between the qualification phase and the negotiation phase is that they have, I don't know, put you in touch with the person responsible for making a decision, or that they have activated a demo and actually used it, checked out your tool, and actually spent time in your system or whatever it is that you offer. Um, there should be a clear difference between each of those phases, otherwise your sales reps are not really able to work together well, it's difficult to collaborate and to move on. Roles and responsibilities should also be crystal clear. You sh each sales rep should know exactly what to do when this scenario happens and this kind of buying persona comes in. The next point is also, I think, um, not so new. You should automate as much as possible. A, in order to ensure your scalability, and B, to make your life easier and to enable your sales reps to focus on what really matters. So if you don't need to have a person um, uh, uh, spending a lot of time on one phase and you can automate that somehow, then do it. Do it from the beginning. Um, make sure that your, your process is as such that it can grow quickly and that it, it saves you time and resources as you go along. <laughs> and then we have more arrows. So this is uh, uh, something that I showed in my last workshop as well. This is a, a process uh, uh, that you can maybe take it as an example. Um, this is what works for us. It doesn't necessarily have to work for you. But here you can see all of the things that I've been talking about until now. On the left, you have the role and responsibility of the marketeer. The marketeer is responsible for bringing in the leads, for generating the leads. Below that, you have the different touch points, the different points of contact. They come in via content that you spread, via AdWords that you set up, events that you organize, or a referral program that you may have from the very beginning, or through promoters whose job is to resell or to evangelize your product. Or it comes in through your marketing automation tools. But basically, it's very clear in this point that this is where the leads come from, and this is who they are, so to speak. After that, once they have, in our case, activated a trial, in your case it could also be filled out a form, or sent you an email, or tweeted something, or whatever it is, requested a demo, requested a phone call, or a meeting. Once that has happened, then the first sales rep comes in. Now, the inside sales rep, in our case, has a very clear role and a very clear responsibility. It's his or her job to connect with the lead, to qualify the lead, and to set up calls, send emails, send information, and maybe do a Skype call or set up a meeting that rules out that um, uh, this lead can either not pay for the service or that, is looking, that, the, that the lead is looking for the right thing um, and that we can actually help this lead with whatever problem that they have. So as you see here, the process is quite clearly uh, 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 divided between each other because once the inside sales has qualified, that's when our closer comes in. So that's when a sales rep comes in who is focused only in closing the customer. And though that means basically a lot of different responsibilities than what the inside sales reps do. Because the closer doesn't have to qualify anymore. He doesn't have to talk to the lead anymore about whether there is a fit, whether there is a match. What the closer does is focus only on getting the customer to sign up, uh, sign your contract, um, uh, or use your, use, your, use your product. 
In our case, that happens through a demonstration or through a meeting where we show the tool, we explain very, very in, uh, in a very detailed manner how it works. So obviously, the skill set, and this is why I talked about the skill set in the beginning, is different than what our inside sales reps have. So the closer would, if you were to put uh, the, 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 the general sales structure that I showed before below it, would be in the negotiation phase and in the offer phase. Whereas the inside sales rep would be in the lead phase, in the very beginning part, in the qualification phase. Once the closer has closed the customer, you've won them, yay, everything is great, that's when our customer success manager comes in, and that's where the second part of the sales process starts. This is where you try to make your, uh, try to keep your customer from churning, and try to keep them happy enough to make sure that they stay with you for as long as possible. Are there any questions on this uh, before we continue? No? Okay. So, in a nutshell, the first part of setting up your business is basically to understand it first by asking yourself the five questions I mentioned in the beginning, setting up a sales funnel and a customer journey that have two different goals, closing the customer and retaining the customer, implementing the tools from the beginning to help you run your business, to have a data-driven approach, and defining a set of rules and scenarios to make the life of your sales rep easier and to understand how to move forward in an aligned approach. Once you've done that, the next question is how to tweak your sales process because just setting it up in the beginning doesn't mean you're done for the day. What that means is you've had You've set up a, a, a general foundation, but as you go along, you should constantly be thinking about where are my bottlenecks? How can I make it more efficient? How can I make it faster? How can I have a higher return with the same investment? All of these things should be going through your mind as you grow your business. Um, uh, no matter if you've set it up already and, you, and, and it's working for you, or whether it's not working for you. You should constantly be thinking about tweaking. How do you do that? You think about what are the most common objections when you speak uh, to a lead, when you're s trying to sell your service or your product. Coming up with a category and writing those things down, putting it in a sheet that's easy for everyone to understand, that collects all of the objections and the pain points and things like that, will help you immensely. Because then, as you progress, your sales reps will become more and more experienced and more and more accustomed and more and more able to deal with the objections that they face and that they encounter every day when they sell. If you don't save that somewhere, you don't register that in a database, you don't register um, uh, uh, how the uh, first points of contact went down or what the first questions were or where the skepticism came from, it'll be more difficult for you to understand how to improve it. The second thing you can always do is think about which buyer persona has the most potential. How will this help you tweak your business? Well, let's say you have five different personas and persona five, which is the, um, I don't know, uh, 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 the lead that wants to make the jump from offline to online and can somehow use your business uh, uh, or use your product um, to optimize uh, their own workflow. Maybe this buyer persona has the highest potential of becoming a customer because they see the need for it and the contrast between not using your tool and using your tool the most. So if you have understood that, which buyer persona has the highest potential, then because as a, in a startup you're always short on time, you're always short on money, maybe it makes more sense to focus only on them first rather than on a buyer persona that has, that has a very low probability of becoming a customer. So I'm not saying always go for the low hanging fruit, but understanding who has the highest probability of actually uh, closing a deal with you will really help you when you're, when you're strapped for time and you're strapped for money. The next question you could ask yourself is, what is your ideal sales cycle duration? Now, what do I mean by that? Um, in the last workshop I had here, there was someone here who asked me, do the things that you have been talking about apply also to businesses like mine? 
who only have two big clients a year. So you could have a B2C business with hundreds or thousands of users or customers or whatever, but you could also have a business that deals only with huge conglomerates or corporates or, or um, uh, uh, that have very big size that maybe will, there won't be more than two of them or three of them in a quarter or in, uh, uh, or in an entire year. So when he asked me that question, I really thought about it because it makes a lot of sense to think about how long it takes you, and this is something you should observe as you go along, to close your customer from the beginning to the end. So from quote to cash, how long does it take you on average? How much time do you have to spend to close one customer? Um, knowing this will also help you to do your forecasting and it will also help you to um, plan your resources and to delegate your tasks in a way that help you achieve your goals. Because if you know, all right, it takes me about, it takes us about three months to close a customer on average, then your entire structure and your process and your marketing and, every, and your product development should revolve around that. If, if it takes you three months and you know that three months is the ideal time because it takes about, I don't know, uh, 30 days for the, for the customer to test, and then there's a maybe 14-day phase where there's a feedback loop and they want some, I don't know, custom implementations or things like that, and then they test it for another 14 days, and then maybe there's another feedback loop. Whatever it is, you know exactly, all right, I need five days or I need a week or I need three months, ideally, in order to close a customer. The process should reflect that and enable that. Where are the bottlenecks? It seems like an obvious thing to ask yourself, but it's actually something that you should really keep in the back of your mind every day, because there will always be bottlenecks. And with bottlenecks, I don't just mean, hmm, where are we stagnating? So it, it could also mean, of course, okay, we get 500 leads, um, we connect with them, and in the qualification phase, half of them uh, fall away, and then in the next phase, when you do uh, uh, the negotiation, another half fall away. Okay, then you understand, these are where my bottlenecks are, what is the reason for that? Maybe the way you're qualifying doesn't fit to the type of customers who are engaging with you. Or maybe what you're offering maybe isn't correct. Maybe your pricing is too high, maybe your conditions are um, not suitable for your market. Understanding the bottlenecks will uh, give you insights into what you need to change and what you need to optimize along the way. And the last part is, not only should you optimize your process for your team, but also for your customers. Everything you do, every, everything you, uh, you tweak, should have the goal of making it very easy for your customers to go along from one step, from lead, to, qual to connect, to qualify, to negotiation, offer, won, and lost. That means that if you have high barriers on your websites or, um, I don't know, they have to fill out a form with lots of information or maybe they need to have, I don't know, something set up um, already before they start your business, uh, before they start your product or your service, Making it as easy as possible for your customers to become customers is highly important. You should not just be thinking about your process internally, but also externally. So, once you've evaluated that, it's easy for you to do reporting. And with reporting, I mean looking at the data you have gathered in your CRM tool or in your uh, project management tool, um, looking at the leads that you've registered already, where you know your different buying personas, the ideal sa sales cycle duration, what the most common objections are, and all of those things will help you to do reporting along the way. The second part, obviously, is calculating as you go along. That means understanding what is the monthly recurring revenue that you need to achieve your goals? What do you need to make on a monthly basis or maybe on a yearly basis in order to have the growth that you want to see for your business? Once you've done that, it will be so much easier for you to analyze the data that you've collected because you will understand how to, to uh, um, manage your resources and where to put your emphasis on later. 
And then obviously, iteration. That's the tweaking part that I meant. Maybe you need to make it easier for your, uh, uh, for your reps, or maybe you need to take away a step in the process. Maybe you need to shorten the number of days they can test your tool or whatever it is. Optimizing and automating, once you've done your reporting and your data analysis, is something that should happen on, in, a, in a regular cycle. Maybe every month, maybe every week, maybe every quarter, that's up to you. But you should definitely keep this in mind once you've set up your process. And now you have three arrows. <laughs> so, I talked a little bit about lead management before and I mentioned that I did a whole workshop on this topic. I'm not gonna do that here, but I want to stress it because it's really very important, so I'm gonna go into it a little bit. These are basically the questions you should ask yourself constantly. Your sales rep should know exactly how many leads came in and when. How many were lost and why and how? How long did it take to close them? Because you want to know your sales cycle duration. Which phase of the pipeline are your leads in right now? It will help you to understand whether half of your leads are all, almost in that closing phase or whether they're still in the first phase where you know it'll take a month until they move on to the next phase. You should definitely understand how many of your leads are where because that is going to help you um, uh, um, manage things along the way. What is their value in euros? Why is this important? Obviously because you would like to uh, uh, calculate as you go along. And how many conversions are you, are you achieving uh, uh, while you are in your selling stage? What's your churn rates? How high is the probability of turning a, a lead into a customer? And obviously what the pending actions are. That means maybe they still need a demo, maybe you still need to go to their office, maybe you still need to speak to, their, to the uh, person responsible for making the decision. Asking yourself these questions will, well, how do I put it? It will give you a clearer picture in something that maybe seems quite straightforward, but as you dig beneath the surface and as you go into more detail, this is going to be essential for you. It should be ingrained in, your, in the blood of all of your sales reps from the very beginning. A tip th from my side is to visualize your customer journey. Always have it in place somewhere. Be able to tell your sales reps, okay, look, we are here now, we want to come here, how do we do that? Why? Because, well, your goal should always be to set up a, a process that enables you to collaborate efficiently. And visualizing that will help you. This is an example of what I mean with visualizations. Um, so don't worry about the Dutch words on the left. <laughs> I'm not, the great, uh, I'm not a great uh, Photoshopper, so it had to stay in there. But uh, here you can see, okay, I have 48 new leads with a revenue of 333 euros. In the, first con in the first phase of contact, I lost one. One person didn't want to uh, agree to a meeting or meet with me to talk about how I can help them with my business. After that, I sent out 46 quotes, meaning you lost two leads. This is super, super important because you can see, all right, I'm doing okay in each stage of the phase. There are no bottlenecks. This is a pretty high uh, success rate. All right, maybe where, um, what I need to optimize is in a different area of your sales process. For example, if you see here, if you look at this pie chart, it makes it very easy to understand, all right, I have um, around two and a half thousand euros uh, in leads waiting to be closed. 33% um, uh, um, were successful. That means out of those leads, I've sent a quote to 33% of them, so to one third. And you can understand, all right, I have a very healthy ratio from the first point of contact to the second and the third phase of your uh, 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 sales process. This is also interesting because this will show you how many of your existing customers return to you and how many new customers um, uh, engage with your business. This will basically enable you to create a funnel 
that adheres to that, that adapts to that, and to do your forecasting and cooperate with your marketing as you go along. So this is something that our uh, tool also offers. It's basically the stage duration by user. I can see here that my colleague, Michel, has a, a, a pretty high number of quotes that he has sent after 80 days. So this helps you to understand also where your bottlenecks are in terms of timing, in terms of duration, in terms of efforts that you need to implement in each stage. So this is also interesting for us especially because for us it's interesting to see where our customers are based. So if we know, all right, we have a high amount of customers in the West, then maybe the marketing we should do or the efforts we, uh, 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 we should input should be focused more on that geographical area. These are, this is just an example. Maybe this is not important for you, but this is what I mean with choosing a tool um, that will really help you keep an overview and keeping a visual approach for you and your sales reps um, from the very beginning. So this is a visualization that, we, that also helps us a lot because our sales team is very data-driven, as I already mentioned. We also have different roles and responsibilities. When our head of sales comes, uh, uh, delegates tasks, he maybe won't give the next big deal to Jean-Marc, who takes on average about a day to get into contact with the customers, not because he's lazy, but just because he's really busy at the moment. Maybe it makes more sense to delegate the task to Benjamin, who on average only takes 17 hours to get into contact with your customers. This is what I meant before by um, keeping an eye on your bottlenecks, because if you make a promise or a claim on your website, we'll get back to you within 24, days, uh, 24 hours. You should definitely keep that promise. Or if you know, all right, um, we're losing a lot of our leads after the first moment they come into contact with us, if we get into contact with them after a week, then you know you have to speak to them, you have to contact them before those seven days are over because experience has shown that that's where you lose them. Another really interesting thing, obviously, is the loss reasons. So we have a pie chart here where we know, okay, about, I don't know, let's say 20% were not really a fit for us either because they were looking for something we couldn't offer, or maybe because they couldn't afford it, or maybe because, I don't know, there were technical aspects that didn't fit. We know that about 20% of the leads that come in, we lose because of that. So maybe what that tells us is, maybe our communication needs to change so that the inbound leads that come in um, are automatically filtered by what we communicate on our website. Maybe it's not clear enough what we do, because if it were super clear, then these leads probably wouldn't contact us, right? Another, th another point uh, um, that could also be interesting, at least for us, is when our uh, sales reps are not able to contact our leads, we lose a huge bunch of them. Why is that? Because well, you know, you sign, you sign up somewhere, you forget about it, and then three months later you realize you still have a login. What was your password? I don't know. I don't want to get a new password. Okay, I'm just going to leave it. For us, it's very, very important to get into contact with the lead immediately. And if we are not able to do that, we see that almost half of them are lost. So that's why it's very important for us to know how long it takes our sales reps to get into contact because we know we need to contact them within a day, that's our time frame, in order to, keep, to catch them, in order to keep them from falling out of the net. So obviously all of these things that I'm talking about are examples um, for us, but I think you can still apply it to your business depending on the lost reasons you have. Timing. Timing is also an, an interesting aspect. S let's say you have um, a product that you really need to use for like a week in order to really love it. Maybe it doesn't make sense to get in touch after one day. Maybe you have to allow your leads to test it first, to apply it to their business, to integrate it with their product, to s really see the benefit before you contact them. It's possible. It really depends on what kind of a product that you offer. But understanding the timing is highly important. If you get in touch too early or too late, 
it could result in losing the customer or it could result in a churn. Other reasons, this, this, you can specify this obviously for yourself. Let's say there are five objections that keep coming up, they keep coming up every time you speak to a lead. Maybe if you see that one of those objections makes up about 50% of the loss reasons, maybe then it's time to speak to your product development and change your tool or your product or offer something new or offer something different. So understanding why you lose these leads is it's really, really, really useful because you can then evaluate whether it makes sense to adapt to it and to change your product or your service somehow. Where your leads come from is also an important aspect that you can visualize very easily with not all tools, but I hope most tools, at least our tool offers that. So why do we have an inside sales and then, a, and then a, a, a closer sales rep. Why? Because we've learned along the way that most of our uh, leads are inbound. They come from the websites or through SEA. That basically means that most of these leads, because we don't talk to them personally, because they have not engaged with us on a personal level, they have to be qualified, right, before they can move on to the next stage. So, if we would not have most of our leads coming in from the website, maybe we wouldn't even have an inside sales rep. Maybe if all of our leads came from events or from resellers, the process would be entirely different because the qualification takes place elsewhere. It takes place face to face or maybe through, I don't know, um, uh, um, a buy two, get one free kind of uh, a referral program. But knowing where they come from and how much of your leads are distributed in each of those uh, touch points will uh, um, define your structure as you go along. Is that, is that clear? Okay. So this is uh, something that maybe is not relevant for you, but it's another example I would like to show. This graph basically shows the probability for um, a user to bring the next deal to the next phase. And with a user, I mean in our case as a sales rep. So you have the different phases over there. In our case, it's always a meeting that has to take place and a quote that's sent and then either accepted or not accepted. And you have the probability in the bottom. I'm not sure if you can see this, but it goes from 0% to 100%. Now, Let's say um, uh, I, CS is me, I am really great at uh, speaking to a lead the moment they, they, they activate a trial. And then I have great conversations with them on the phone when I contact them, qualify them, I'm really able to empathize with, uh, empathize with what they need and where their problems are. And you know, I take the whole thing um, basically very successfully to the phase quotation sense. Maybe I'm not the best at closing them though for whatever reason. Maybe that just doesn't uh, fit to my skill sets or it doesn't match uh, um, uh, how I do things up until that point. But knowing the probability is very, very important because then it will help you to, to tweak a process in a way that you can increase this probability as you go along. This doesn't mean that I'm a terrible salesperson. This only means that my strengths, they lie elsewhere. So as a manager or as a founder of a business, it will help you to keep an overview in all aspects, not just in your conversion rates, your churn rates, your, um, uh, the number of leads coming in, uh, how long it takes to close them, but also how your team actually deals with it, which skill set fits. And maybe you know, all right, maybe you want to adapt your process completely to your team because you know they are the most important thing. They've been with me from the beginning. They know the product like no other. I don't want to hire different people with different skill sets. What I want to do because I believe that this is the right way of going about things is to adapt the process somehow that accommodates their skills. It's up to you, but what you should do is analyze your business and your team in a way so you can come up with something that works for you internally but also externally. So that's been a lot of information at once. Um, uh, I hope it was clear for you. What I would like to uh, uh, summarize for you to take away is to constantly, constantly think about your business by asking yourself the questions that I mentioned in the beginning, to constantly iterate as you go along by analyzing the data you collect, and you should collect the data, 
no matter if you have one customer or a thousand. And by constantly tweaking, iterating, and automating where you can, because that's the only way to grow a scalable business, and growing a scalable business is basically what a startup is all about, and what founding a company that is uh, successful is all about. The way you do that, it depends on your team, on how you like to do things, how your market uh, works, um, how your product is built, all of those things. They are specific to your company. So there's no uh, uh, one way of doing it, but there are ways of analyzing and understanding your business that will help you come up with the perfect way to do it. Um, if you are a startup and uh, you would like to uh, try it out and test a team leader, you are very welcome to uh, um, apply for our startups program. You can basically use our tool for six months for free. Uh, that, that means all of the modules, so CRM and project management, invoicing, ticketing, all of those things. Um, the stats and the visual visualizations that you saw are all included, of course. Um, and if you have any questions about that, you're free to ask me after the talk. And that's my email. So if you have any questions, uh, you're free to shoot them now. Thanks a lot. Hi. Uh, I wanted to, to ask you if you've, you've discovered any pattern in the, in the growth maturity of your sales team. Like you're starting with five people, which is different from 20 or 50. Um, different organizations in your teams or the way you use the tools or you configure them. So with patterns, you mean change patterns or yeah. growth patterns? Like, do, you, do you think like your first five sales team should be organized or use the tools? as when you are 20 or 50? Have you seen different steps, maturity in these mm -hmm. sales developments? Yes, of course, we've definitely seen a difference there because uh, the, the, the process that we had with five people is a different one than the process we have now with, I don't know, I think we're 40 salespeople. So um, we've become more data-driven as we go along. Uh, we've become much more experienced and much more organized because the longer we do, we've been doing this, the more data we have. The more we understand our customers, the more we understand our market, and the more we understand where we have to put our emphasis and where we don't have to put our emphasis. So as I mentioned in the beginning, um, you know, our CEO doesn't drive around uh, Belgium uh, all day long talking to each lead anymore, and we also don't uh, invest in, uh, uh, um, in things that we know don't have a high ROI. We've known, we've learned along the way that we are soft sellers, we like to do inside sales, we like to have inbound leads, and that's where we put our emphasis, and that's how we've structured our sales team and our process along the way. Because as our business has grown, we've, we've learned who is our most, uh, uh, let's say, um, uh, most probable buying persona. We've, un we've understood that we are, our tool is very useful for agencies, for software development agencies, for creative design agencies, for any kind of company that has a lot of contact with their customers, for any kind of company that needs to do CRM and project management all in one or in a centralized place. So all of understanding that has helped us to create a structure that enables them to engage with us easily and enables us to close them easily. So. The qualification phase, for example, has also changed a lot because we know now what are the lost reasons, what are the biggest objections, what are the pain points of the leads that come in and how can we solve them. So we have adapted our structure um, along the way to accommodate a lot of things, but mainly to stay scalable. And that's something that you should always do because your process will definitely change, definitely. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's inevitable as your business grows. Clarissa, thank you very much for your workshop. I'm very interested in uh, team leader. Uh, it sounds that you're using and adapting inbound marketing for your company. Uh, is that true? And uh, are you also using other forms of marketing to generate uh, business for your company? Um. Yes, so we, we do have inbound marketing and this is actually interesting because this was, I had the same question after the last workshop. It was mainly on, uh, uh, the question was focused on lead generation. So I'm not a marketeer, so I'm going to be careful in my response because I don't want to say something that's not true. But uh, as I said before, 
almost all of our leads, they come in uh, through touch points that are automated or that are online. Um, we use on, uh, online, uh, uh, we use marketing automation tools to help us in that way. Also because we are based in lots of different countries. We have a headquarters in Belgium, but also an office in Berlin uh, and in Amsterdam and in Madrid. So, you know, for us it makes a lot of sense to automate that phase and to do lead generation that is um, efficient and that helps us to really handle a, a, a high amount of uh, um, uh, leads in, engaging with us. Um, the way we do our marketing is also very data driven. It's very um, adapted and localized to our local markets um, and we try to uh, keep it uh, optimized as much as possible. So we try to um, tweak that all the time. Um, using different different tools. Does that answer your question a little bit? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> In our case, uh, uh, emailing is quite important and yeah. email automation is quite important. So mm -hmm. I was wondering uh, with your tool, mm -hmm. uh, how does it work? Mm -hmm. uh, how the email are sent? Are they sent by the CRM? Or is there some kind of synchronization with other tools? Uh, uh, yes, um, we integrate with MailChimp and with Campaign Monitor. Um, so you can push the data from your CRM uh, to one of the other tools and, back, and vice versa. Um, what we try not to be, we try to focus on the things we are good at, so we are definitely not uh, an emailing tool, um, but we offer an integration that allows you to do, to send out campaigns, to track the opening rates and things like that easily and keep that data in one place. So what you can do with our tool, for example, is that in your CRM you can create different segments and different lists based on user behavior um, or uh, on uh, um, uh, the modules that they have um, uh, subscribed to or that they have bought and you can push that data to Campaign Monitor and MailChimp to send out your mailing and to automate your mailing and vice versa the data that you get from there you can also push back to the tool so yes we do do that and what we also have on the topic of emailing is uh, email tracking which from where you can actually track your emails uh, directly to the CRM from your Gmail with one click and you can also uh, uh, delegate a task from your email with one click so we try to keep things actionable and we try to offer integrations where we see it makes sense um, uh, but we don't want to offer more than what you need. So um, our tool is really very focused on small and medium-sized businesses. And in your case, if you automate your mailing, I, f I think you'll find that it's quite useful. It's, it's useful to do that with Team Leader. Thank you. You're welcome. I think that's it uh, from your side. Thank you so much for listening and have a great day. Bye.